This is the edition unfiltered podcast. I think I should let you guess what this week's episode is about. If you can't guess, it's about mosquitoes. And the reason I asked you to guess was because if you had listened to the randomness rambling that I did in the last episode, you would know that mosquitoes have been on my mind for almost a month. And you might ask, that's a really weird thing to have on your mind. Why would you have that on your mind? Well, thank you for asking that question because I will tell you the answer to it. And the answer is because I found out some really, really fascinating information about mosquitoes that completely blew my mind, which is why they've been on my mind. Now, I made a promise last week saying that I would hunt down a particular video that blew my mind about mosquitoes and then summarize that video for you so you don't have to hunt down that video. Unfortunately, after many, 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 many failed attempts, I have still failed. So I will talk about a small portion of the video that I remember. And I gave you a sneak peek on that last time, which was about how mosquitoes led or influenced the creation of gin and tonic. Never thought that would be a sentence I would have said. But here we are. Now, throughout history, we've known mosquitoes have had a significant if anything, impact on human populations. That's honestly that all I thought they did was just kill people, suck their blood, and buzz around your ear when you're trying to sleep. And, and the reason that they have such a big impact on human populations is primarily through the spread of diseases, which we know as malaria, the most common one. And then we have yellow fever and dengue fever. While these diseases that I just mentioned have caused an enormous amount of suffering and death, they have also sort of indirectly led to the creation of the gin and tonic cocktail, one of the most popular drinks in the world today. We know malaria is a particularly devastating disease that has affected humans for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. If you didn't know, malaria just didn't happen very recently. It's been around for a really long time. Considering that it's still prevalent in many of the tropical and subtropical regions in the, of the world, with particularly we all associate malaria as the sub-Saharan Africa, where it is and still remains a leading cause of death for children, young adults, adults all the way through. Now, during the 19th century, when the British Empire was expanding rapidly and many of its colonies were in malaria endemic regions, the British officials and soldiers in these regions were particularly vulnerable to the disease, which posed a significant threat to their health and well-being. Now, I want to do like a sidetrack because I just remembered this. I'm taking away from the story for a second there, but bear with me. So we know that it is prevalent in sub-Saharan. It is prevalent in Africa, which means that people from Africa are more immune to malaria. They're they're their immune system is is sort of already adapted to it and it, it kind of it the disease doesn't affect people from Africa as much as it does from people who have never been in malaria driven regions so like for example from the west they come down to any part of Africa malaria would affect them a lot stronger than they would another person from Africa. And when the British realized this, this is something that really was it was insanely <laughs> insight. I wouldn't say insightful, but like an eye opener or like, oh, damn, that makes a lot of sense. But when the British realized that people from Africa were a lot stronger when it came to the disease, they decided to bring the people from Africa up to America. So one of the reasons why the British decided to go for people from Africa as slaves was because they could withstand and work in the cotton fields with that were infested with mosquitoes in a more healthier way than the British could. Yeah, anyway, that was like, uh, really blew my mind. So when the British Empire started realizing that they really needed to figure out a way to be able to combat the disease, they started to experiment with different methods that would help prevent and treat malaria. One of the most promising treatments that they came across was quinine or quinine, depending on what part of the world you're from, which basically is, so this is a bitter compound that comes from the bark of a cinchona tree and quinine had 
been used for centuries by indigenous peoples in South America to treat fevers and other alignments. And the European explorers, and explorers is a really nice word to use here, who had encountered the bark had also recognized its medicinal properties. And so the same explorers figured that it would help with malaria like it did everything else. So by the early 19th century, quinine had become widely recognized as an effective treatment for malaria. Now, one thing that I, I do want to mention here and that I honestly, I wish I could remember, but there was mention of how in the very beginning of the discovery of the fact that quinine could help with preventing and treating malaria, people in Britain, particularly the rich and the royalties, decided to keep this something between them. So they didn't want to share this, this compound with the rest of the population. They wanted to keep it to themselves. And so for a very long time, this was, it became really expensive to be able to afford to get this treatment for yourself. And so obviously when you gatekeep something like this, the prices will go up. And to add on to that, they also made sure that soldiers that went into these tropical regions or soldiers that went into America who were in charge of taking care of the workers in the cotton fields were able to withstand this disease. And so they were also, the supply was also shortened because a lot of this compound was given to them and then left for the royals and the riches. And so it was really expensive for anybody ordinary to be able to get access to this. Obviously, that changed with time. But back to the point, <laughs> quinine had it, it had a major drawback. So if you don't already know this, if you've never tried uh, anything that had queen, has, has the ingredient quinine in it, you will notice that it is extremely bitter and it is difficult to swallow in its natural form. Now, this is back in the day where all the recipes and all these different ways of having medication were not a well-known thing yet. So people had to get creative. And so the British officials and soldiers in India and other malaria endemic regions began to mix quinine with soda water and sugar to, to make it more palatable. And this mixture very quickly became known as tonic water and was soon used by British soldiers and officials as a preventative measure against malaria. So to this concoction was later added gin the addition of gin to tonic water became a popular drink among British officials and soldiers was a, obviously a natural next step. Gin, which is made from, this is something I didn't know either. So this was information to me. So it's made from, gin is made from juniper berries and other botanicals and has a distinctive flavor that pairs well with the bitterness of the quinine. So the resulting cocktail or concoction, which became known as gin and tonic. And this now was not only effective at preventing malaria, but also became a popular drink among the British in India and other tropical regions. Now, the addition of lemon. Let's get into the addition of lemon. So we have the gin. We got the tonic. Now let's talk about how lemon was added into this concoction. So when the explorers, and again, I feel like that's a really, really nice word of describing these group of people, but the explorers that went on to figure out where they would go to colonize, what part of the world they would go next to colonize and take over and uh, imprison would be at sea for a very, very long time. You know what happens when you're at sea for a really long time? You get a vitamin C deficiency. And when you get a vitamin C deficiency, you need citric foods, you need oranges, and you need all of this. And so together with taking quinine and tonic water, you have your mixture there to prevent malaria and to help treat malaria, the next thing to do was to figure out, figure out how to treat scurvy, how to prevent scurvy from happening. And so we got lemon. And someone at that time must have been like, oh, what would it be like to just have one drink that we could drink all the time that would, I hesitate saying this, kill two birds with one stone. Let's just add lemon and boom, malaria down and scurvy out of the way. And so that was how lemon was added into this whole mixture and you have the gin and tonic the way it is today. So it makes sense how and why the popularity of the gin and tonic spread beyond the British Empire. And by the early 20th century, it became a very popular drink in the United States and other parts of the world. 
today even. The gin and tonic remains a beloved staple cocktail. It's enjoyed by millions of people around the world. And while mosquitoes did not directly influence the creation of gin and tonic, their role in the spread of malaria and other diseases was a key factor in the development of quinine as a treatment and ultimately what led to the creation of tonic water. Without the threat of malaria, and here's, here's why I say it's really played a big part in this, because without the threat of malaria, it is unlikely that British officials and soldiers in India and other tropical regions would have been motivated to develop a more palatable form of quinine. And similarly, without the popularity of gin among British officials and soldiers, it is unlikely that gin and tonic would have become a popular cocktail. In addition to mosquitoes' role in the creation of gin and tonic, we know that, and we get a little sad here, but malaria has had a profound impact on human history. From people from Africa brought into the West and sold as slaves, it played a part there. From the American Revolution, it played a part there. From, you know, gin and tonic, it played a part there. It's, mosquitoes have really had an impact in the way that our history is. And it's not just affected our history, but it's affected a countless of individuals and societies over the centuries and has been a major factor in the economic and social development of many regions in the world, particularly in the sub-Saharan Africa, where we still know malaria is a, a leading cause of death. Just like how this information blew my mind, it still blows my mind how this disease continues to pose significant challenges to public health and development. But we can't just be grim about everything and we have to look at the silver lining, although the silver lining here has a heavy, heavy gray cloud. Next time you're drinking gin and tonic, just remember, there's a really, really, really interesting history behind the creation of this drink. So now I'm going to make my own concoction. I'm hesitating saying cocktail because I like the word concoction a lot more for obvious reasons. So I'm going to go create my own concoction right now. And I'll let you guys do the same and I'll see you next Wednesday.